Please be seated. <clears throat> so, folks, as I um, prepare to lead in a word of prayer, I remind you to lift up our country. I uh, want to give you an update on Harold. Uh, he saw the doctor this past week, and he has a torn meniscus. I think that that's cartilage. Um, so um, he's got an injection, uh, cortisone, and... Um, He'll see the doctor in four weeks. So lift Harold up in prayer. Uh, also, we remind you of the shirt lifts, uh, the Wynn family who used to attend our church, uh, Fred Legler, uh, Patricia Fogel, uh, Cindy Ellison family. I mean, the list goes on and on. So Chuck, great to see you today. Um, Matt and Martha Brush, please lift them up. Uh, so anyway, uh, just a lot going on. And uh, anyway, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we rejoice in this time. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your presence. And we uh, pray that it would be a great comfort to each of our hearts this morning. Uh, it's our prayer that as we gather, uh, that we would be still before you, uh, that you would settle our hearts and our minds our thoughts. Uh, we pray that you would prepare our hearts in a way where we are touched by you, that we uh, know that we've been with you. Um, we pray that you would settle upon our, our hearts and our spirits in a way um, where we experience the comfort of God, the peace of God, uh, the joy of Christ, uh, and that we would give you this time. Uh, we thank you uh, for all that you do for us, uh, as I just said, Lord, and not only the material uh, provisions, but uh, for the way in which you've provided for us in Christ. Uh, a, an eternal provision, a tremendous provision for life and godliness. You've given us uh, not the ability to live in our own strength, but to live uh, everything, uh, everything in the Christian life was accomplished for us through the Lord Jesus. Uh, he's the only um, Christian who's ever lived perfectly the Christian life. And, and we have such tremendous provision in him. And we pray that we would understand that, uh, that we would draw from his strength and his grace and his life and uh, his heart each and every day. Uh, his thoughts, his words, his actions, his motives, uh, his, uh, the intents of his heart. May we Find the, uh, the presence of mind and heart, uh, Lord, to tap into uh, all that you are and all that you've provided for us in him. Uh, Father, also, we want to lift up our country. Um, many, many needs, Lord, within our country. You know it all. Um, we pray that you would forgive us for the sins of our country, uh, especially uh, how we have kicked you out in, in all phases uh, from... Uh, top to bottom, from the, the school uh, to policy, uh, decision-making, uh, foreign policy, uh, everything from top to bottom, we've, uh, we've kicked you out. And we pray uh, that you would have your hand uh, stay the judgment. Uh, we pray, Lord, uh, for our country, our leaders, uh, that you would speak to their heart, uh, that they would look at you as the God of history, um, the God with whom they have to do. Uh, we ask and pray that you would work uh, in and through uh, people uh, that know you, that have been placed in office or in policy positions or uh, staff positions, uh, that they would have a tremendous influence uh, on our leaders and our country. Uh, we also pray, Lord, too, that our prayers, um, you would honor our prayers as we uh, humble ourselves before you. Uh, we repent and uh, we lift up our country. Also, Father, too, uh, we bless you for a woman's concern, for a woman's options, and thank you for the work that they do. And we pray that this fundraising time would uh, be uh, way more than what they expect. And uh, we pray that you would be in every penny of it uh, and that you would um, give this organization more success that uh, they would, uh, by your grace, double um, their efforts for this uh, upcoming year. 
Uh, also, Father, too, I want to lift up uh, the Wynn family, especially Diana. Bless her heart. Uh, be, be, may she sense your closeness and your presence. Uh, also, Father, too, I uh, want to lift up Sandy Sherman. Uh, thank you so much for Sandy. Uh, bless her heart. May she sense your presence. I uh, want to lift up Mike Shirtliff, Lord. Uh, bless his heart. May he sense your presence. And also, we lift up Carol. Give her uh, the grace and strength to go to the nursing home uh, each and every day and to be with her husband. And we, uh, we think of uh, Fred and the many, many others uh, uh, that need your healing hand. We thank you for Edith Perfetti being here today. Uh, bless her heart. And thank you for Chuck being here as well. Um, and bless his heart as well. And thank you for blessing uh, each of us uh, with one another's presence today and especially your presence. And we want to give you all the, the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, at this particular time, we have a scripture reading. Our first reading this morning is actually the conclusion of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. It's found on page 895 of the Church Bible. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of our Lord. This morning's second scripture reading again from the third chapter of the book of Acts. We'll be reading the first ten verses. And again, that can be found on page 980 in the New Church Bible. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And to be, he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. May the Lord add his blessing. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, uh, open the scripture to our hearts as only your Holy Spirit can do, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, uh, we're going to look at this passage of uh, scripture in Acts 3 this morning, and this is, uh, this is the first miracle performed by Christ through the church 
after Pentecost. Uh, it, the miracle that's performed by Christ through the church, his people, specifically Peter and John. Now, what I want to do this morning is I want to challenge us um, in how we approach and see this passage with miracles. Uh, I think what happens is, sadly, when we come across a passage that contains miracles in Scripture, what we do is we're very dismissive of it, and we say, oh, well, miracles were for yesteryear. Uh, that's typically what we do. We look at the Bible and we say, well, you know, uh, there were three great periods in the Scriptures. You know, Moses did miracles, and Elijah and the prophets did miracles, and during Jesus' time they did miracles. But, you know, we really don't see, you know, any other periods, and so therefore we're very dismissive of miracles. That's typically how it goes. And so what happens is, you know, we fall into this mindset that miracles aren't for today. Or what we do is we say, well, God could do them, but he's probably not going to do them. You see, that's what we do. Or we say, well, it's probably not God's will, which is a reasonable argument, fair point. But doesn't this perpetuate the forces of unbelief? It always does. Why? We just talked about God being indescribable, uncontainable, and yet we want to put him in the box, right? That's what we do. And, and this form of unbelief often causes us to look past the principles in Scripture that are operational today. God is amazing, and he does amazing things. You know, uh, you are a miracle, a walking miracle, because Jesus Christ caused you, I trust, to be born again unto a living hope. That's miraculous. That's raising the dead. And then what happens is, you know, we, 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 for, we, we embrace this form of unbelief, and so, you know, we, we kind of, you know, are dismissive of miracles. We put God in the box, and then what happens is, like this lame man, you know, we stay in this mindset for 40 years. That's what we do. And we, we fail to consider and remember what Peter did. Peter invoked the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. Verse 6, in the name of Jesus Christ. Our, our Pentecostal brothers and sisters have that one down. Now, sometimes they overshoot heaven, but uh, great that they shoot for heaven, right? And, and so way, the way we want to understand this here is that invoking the name of Jesus is to invoke his power and his authority. The church is an extension of Jesus Christ. We're his body. Uh, I looked at this. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. It's in the present. And, and you know, Christ is the great I am. You know that. The great I am. And he reminded his disciples, as Bill read the passage of Scripture, he reminded his disciples that he possesses all power and all authority, not only in heaven, but also on the earth. And so, in the name of Jesus, we understand that when we call upon him, he is able to do and as Paul says in Ephesians, he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. In our spiritual lives and in obstacles that are before us. And we forget that, don't we? We totally forget that. And so what happens is, like this paralyzed man, many of us are paralyzed in our own right. We don't invoke the name of Jesus in situations, do we? We don't reach down like Peter into situations. We don't use the name of Jesus. You know, we kind of put ourselves in that box. Uh, we don't rise and walk like the beggar. We don't expect miracles. We expect the mundane. That's what we do. We expect the earthly silver and gold to bail us out. You know, we throw the uh, expectant daily coin to the situation. Maybe toss up a quick prayer. <coughs> How often do we say, in the name of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you what, I, I find, I find uh, some real demonic stuff coming at me at times. 
And I'm invoking the name of Jesus a lot. Get behind me, Satan. Be gone from my presence. You have no authority here. And he doesn't. Now, I looked at this passage, and I thought, you know, this is something that most of us can relate to, right? Either, either as the beggar, maybe you haven't been a beggar, but I'm talking about, you know, you, you know people who have been beggars, so to speak, right? But I think it's something that we can all relate to, because we, we all, all of us know of people who have had physical ailments, daily burdens, seemingly hopeless situations, you know, kind of like this man, that the scripture tells us that he was 40 years of age, born with a congenital disease from birth. His feet and his ankles weren't working, you know, uh, um, deformed. And, and, and we, but we all know of situations where people are without God and seemingly without hope. Maybe we know people that are beyond 40 years without God and without hope, devoid of the life of God, devoid of the miraculous. You know, I started to try to put myself into the mindset of this beggar. Now, I want you to think about this, because I think this is where we can all relate. Think of the family burdens that this beggar had, or his family had. The care, the daily concerns for a livelihood. Uh, Daily provisions. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm thinking, thank God that he had friends and neighbors, a community network to carry him to the temple. I'm pretty certain that he did not have a wife. I mean, really, who wants to kind of marry into that situation? We know that, right? Who wants that? And, and, and I look at this and I say, yet in one moment, all of his misfortunes for 40 years were changed in one moment simply by invoking in the name of Jesus Christ. We forget that. And, by the way, it happened at the temple, not at the casino, right? You know, people run down the Foxwoods to change their misfortunes. They look for silver and gold. They run down there to change their misfortunes when they should be running to church to change their future. It's true. This beggar experienced the transforming power of Jesus Christ. He goes for 40 years, same old, same old, same old, being carried to the temple daily, every day helpless and asking for money. Can you imagine living that kind of life? Can't walk, so dependent, asking for money, sounding like a broken record, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. You've seen it, right? I used to work in downtown Philadelphia. I mean, there were on every, on every corner. If you go into Boston or any major city, I mean, it's even worse out in L.A. and Seattle. It's insane. Do you ever think this beggar tired of this situation? You know, I mean, you think about it. Uh, how, ma how many years have you been doing the drill, you know, living life? Don't you tire of situations? I, I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine being in this man's shoes. Probably couldn't even put on shoes. Do you think people ever tired of hearing of this guy? Alms for the poor, alms for the poor, I can't walk. And, and yet, later we see him leaping and rejoicing and praising God in the temple. What a contrast. What a contrast of how Jesus Christ can change your life. And I think that's what this passage teaches us. God is about the miraculous and Jesus Christ is the answer. And we forget that. And he's about breaking up the status quo the past, he's about breaking up sin, he's about breaking up living in sin, addictions, <coughs> forgiveness and healing. That's what God's about. You know, uh, what did he say? He didn't come to judge, and yet what do we do? A lot of times we judge people. God always came to forgive and to heal. 
That's what, he, that's what he's about right now. The judgment's coming. We understand that. But I don't care if it's challenges that people have had from birth, whether they're physical, emotional, spiritual, whether it's a life of drugs and alcohol, uh, living in sin. Maybe it's your upbringing. Maybe you had a bad upbringing. Maybe you had bad parents. Maybe it was your environment. I understand that. I, I tell people, I grew up in Philadelphia. Marie, you grew up in Brooklyn, right? Environment. We understand that. But I look at this passage and I say, God is in the business of spiritual transformation, is he not? He's about change. That's, that's what I see here. And, and you know, here's the other thing. It's not about silver and gold solving our problems. People are looking for silver and gold to solve their problems, aren't they? That's what the American dream has become today. You know, lots of money, big house, white picket fence. You know, everything's going to, that's going to solve all your problems. You know, you know something? When people get rich, the scripture says they've been pierced with many pangs, many pains. In fact, it probably creates more problems. It doesn't solve your problems. And, and, and you know that things in life are of more precious value than silver and gold. Amen? Uh, what, what does Solomon say in the Proverbs? A better name above rubies and fine gold, right? Uh, health, inner peace, happiness, love, respect. I mean, these are things, sleep, these are things that money can't buy, right? Hebrews 11.26 tells us that Moses chose Christ over the riches of Egypt. Uh, rich, uh, the riches of Egypt, Egypt was the catch me out that day, right? In that day. Like America, real wealthy, it was the go-to place if you wanted to get rich. And then, of course, what about Christ and the gift of eternal life? How do you, how do you take Christ and the gift of eternal life and measure it? To silver and gold. You can't. You can't. You know, I, I think we get hung up and we look at people and we say, well, they need this and they need that. And you know where we start? We start like the beggar. We start with the silver and gold. Well, how can I help you? Do you need help financially? That's what we do. Oh, we take them a meal. When was the last time we serve them up Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking about this. You know, it's, it's human nature. Years ago, I was in Bible school. I'm riding home on the, uh, the subway or the L, uh, the elevated subway. And uh, there was this guy who was, uh, he, was out of, he, was, he was out of it. He was on drugs or something. And I gave him a dollar. I gave him a dollar. I didn't give him Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if he would have been mentally able to comprehend, but for illustration's sake, I gave him a buck. I didn't give him Jesus. And it's human nature. What we do is we focus on the physical rather than the spiritual. Take a look at the text. The scripture tells us that this guy is being carried to the temple gate, the beautiful gate. And... Uh, in my research, I found out this is, if you're going to go begging at the temple, this is the most promising place to beg. It, because it was the eastern side of the eastern gate, eastern side of the temple. And it was where hordes of people went into. And so this is the, the, the best place. And a beautiful miracle occurs at the beautiful gate. Now, there's some dis differences on where, where the beautiful gate was whether it was further in the temple or was the very outside gate, I'm not going to get into that. The, the point here is this. Notice, notice human nature and the human approach here. The beggar has his hand out stretched for a handout, right? Now, in context, if you take a look in verse 1, it says it was the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. You had uh, prayer... At 9 a.m., you had prayer at 3 a.m. Some think that there was prayer even later than that. I think 9 a.m. and 3 a.m. are safe. So this is, this is probably, uh, this is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
And this is uh, charitable giving as expected. So that's the context. People going up to the temple to worship. You know, if you gave charitably, it was your devotion to God. So that's, that's the context in which this guy finds himself in. And there's nothing wrong with charitable giving because what does the scripture say? If you see your brother or sister in Christ having a need, uh, 1 John 3, uh, 17 and 18, then you meet that physical need, right? But I point this out because that, but that's not the point of the text. When you take a look at the point of the text, it's to remind us that in the name of Jesus Christ, lives are changed. The expectation of this guy was that he would get some money. He would get something that day from somebody. And um, that's why he had his hand out. And you know, I, I, I was looking at this uh, very specifically in the Greek. It's human nature to expect a handout. The text suggests that when he asks for money, Peter gets his attention, right? And when Peter got his attention, the guy expected more than just the little flip of the coin. That's the sense here in the text. In other words, when Peter, when the guy says, hey, give me money, and Peter says, look at us, the guy expected way more than just the flip of the coin. Why is that? Because this was the custom. You've maybe done this before, right? You see somebody on the street corner, and they have some money, and you throw something, you don't stop. You throw something, you know, you're a passerby. You don't look at them, you don't stop, you don't want to get involved, because that's the, just the dynamic. This guy was an outcast. He couldn't make it into the temple. They carried him to the gate. And so when Peter and John stop, that got the guy's attention. And, and he was expecting way more than he would typically get. That's the sense here. He's expecting a big payday. And he got it. I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk. Now, I, I want to ask you. You're sitting in this guy's situation. What would you want? Silver or gold or Jesus Christ? Silver and gold and sit daily, dependent and begging, looking forward to the daily, everyday status quo? Or Jesus Christ and rising and walking and leaping and rejoicing and praising God? I, I, don't, think, I don't think that there's really a choice here, is there? And, you know, I look at this passage and I say, the church, the people of God in our extension of the ministry and life of Jesus Christ. And silver and gold in the name of Jesus do not change lives. Jesus changes a person's life. Now, you can throw silver and gold at a situation, church situations. God will use it. But let's remember, it's not silver and gold given in his name that changes lives. It's Jesus Christ who changes lives. He doesn't need the silver and the gold. I mean, he'll, think, he'll use things that are not given in his name, right? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Doesn't matter. God will use what he wants to use. But it's not about the money, folks, right? <coughs> D didn't we see this last week? Uh, what did Mary teach us? What did the scripture teach us through Mary? What did she demonstrate? She broke a whole year, more than a whole year's vi worth of vial and perfume over Jesus. It wasn't about the money. It was about Jesus. And, and this passage here is teaching us what? It's about Jesus. Not about money. Uh, we were studying uh, Genesis a couple weeks ago. Uh, Abraham had to go rescue Lot. And, and he and several of his friends get, you know, and his trained men go down and they fight against 
the kings that took Lot because kings were warring. And, and one king, I think it was the king of Sodom, wanted to give Abraham some money afterwards. And Abraham's like, I'm all set. I don't need your silver and gold. I want the blessing of God. That's what he was saying. And so it, it's never about the money. And, 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 and what I see here is, is this. Uh, Peter's reach into this situation is the reach of Christ, the hand of Christ, and the touch of Christ. And that is no different than when you or I engage into a situation. If we reach out to help somebody, is it not the hand of Christ? Of course it is. If you do it in Jesus' name, it's the hand of Christ. It's his touch. It's his reach. It's his hand. And, and Peter's nothing more than an instrument, and you and I are nothing more than an instrument. Now, I was reflecting on how we approach needy situations in our society. And let me give you, uh, let me give you some perspective here. How does the government approach these situations? They just throw money at it, right? That's all they ever do. Money, money, money. Most politicians, all they ever seem to do is raise your taxes and come up with new regulations. That's all they ever do. Status quo, same old, same old, same. Nothing ever changes except the raising of your taxes. That's what they do, they throw money at it. Did you read where the current administration is now saying that if one is on unemployment, you have to take a job, regardless of what that job is offered, you have to take it. That's what they're saying. I'm all for people getting off of unemployment and welfare, but isn't this amazing? Wasn't it the Democratic-controlled Congress who gave people more money than that they were making just to stay home and not work? And now these people don't want to go back to work. So if you're making more money by not working, why would you ever want to go back to work? Just throw money at the situation. That's all they ever do. All they ever do. And I take a look at some of you in our congregation. You see the prices going up. You know, nothing's going down. Is your Social Security going up? Not at the level of what's going up with inflationary rates. You know, think about it. The, it's, the government is crippled in their approach. All they ever know, all they ever do, money, money, money. Good godly government, you know what they would do? They would promote God and spiritual healing rather than dependency. They would promote time-honored biblical values. They would promote God over the state. If they really understood it, that's what they would do. But no, money, money, money. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we're starting a 12-step recovery program. Key words, spiritual recovery. It's not an AA group. It's not an NA group. It's a 12-step spiritual recovery group. We wanted to get the word out. Somebody in our congregation went and reached out to contacts, contacts, and the local Suboxone clinic, that's what they give to drug addicts to kind of keep them chill, right? We were told that we can't advertise there. You know why? This is amazing. Because the government has established the local Suboxone clinics as legitimate businesses. So therefore, if we put up advertisements, we may be undermining the drug business. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we can't, we can't post a flyer with the hope that somebody would get off of drugs because that's all they do is provide drugs. It's amazing. Again, they just throw money at it. Keep people dependent, keep them on their addictions rather than being addicted to Christ. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, heaven forbid that people would lead productive and godly lives. No, let's just keep on giving them drugs to keep them dependent. Let's make it a business. Because it's all about the money, right? 
You see, that's why they legalize the pot. All about the money. That's the government approach. And then we, then we have the Judas approach. We looked at Judas last week. Judas is what? It's charity in the name of charity. It's charity in the name of humanity. Understand that that means that you, cry, you cut Jesus Christ out. In other words, you do a good work, but you cut him out of the equation. In Judas' own words, why waste it on Jesus? We could do some great things for the poor. And so Jesus is cut out. And it's not done to the glory of God. It's done to the glory of humanity. That's the Judas approach. Now, there are many good things done in the name of humanity. But think about all of the miracles that they miss because Jesus is cut out. Just throw out God and you throw out the miracles. The, the truly Christian approach here is where you present a situation for a person to rise and walk. You prioritize charity in the name of Jesus Christ. You make it about Jesus and it's done in Jesus' name. And the expectation is that you get out of your situation, that you rise and you walk. You get out of the past and the old, you leap and you rejoice, and you make progress in life in him. That's the Christian expectation. How hard is that? To be dependent upon God rather than government? I guarantee you that if you're dependent upon God rather than government, you'll always be richer than what they throw at you. All day long. All day long. Now, let me move away from that and let me go back to the text here. It's been suggested that this beggar was familiar to Peter and John. Think about it. How can you go to the daily, daily to a gate? How can you go, well, this guy goes daily to the gate. How can you go and worship? And Peter and John did that, right, at least several times a year, it would be pretty hard for them to not recognize this guy. It would be pretty hard for them not to be charitable and throw some coins at this guy. It's possible that they knew of this guy, they saw this guy, and they gave to this guy in the past. I mean, he was at the temple daily. And I want you to see here how the Holy Spirit moves Peter in this time and in this way for what he did and when he did. Because it's, timing is everything. Now, I think it's amazing that it just happens after where God pours out his spirit. And I think we shouldn't miss that point either. The other thing I want to share here, and I'm not too far from being done. <clears throat> I was reflecting, you know, God's timing is everything, isn't it? At the beautiful gate, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. Beautiful, beautiful, miracle, all things beautiful in his time. And as I look at this passage of scripture here, this is the perfect picture of salvation and deliverance. And follow, follow this with me real quickly here. We have a lame man from birth. Are we, on, are, are we not all spiritually lame? Of course we are. We have a person that can't physically function or walk. That's a spiritual picture of the sinner without God's help. We have a poor and pitiful beggar. That's the picture of Adam's race. We have a poor soul who experiences the grace and the mercy and the healing, and he experiences the walking and the leaping and the praising. That, that is totally a picture of what happens when a sinner goes from a sinner to being a redeemed saint, redeemed sinner. That's the experience of the redeemed. And, you know, the other thing here very quickly, I look at this passage, uh, at this miracle in this passage, Notice that it's instantaneous, it's perfect. The guy never learned to walk. I mean, he was crippled for 40 years, and it's not like, you know, he was told, well, go.
go see the high priest and practice your walking, go for a little rehab. It wasn't a process. It was a perfect, it was a perfect healing. And I think that that is also a spiritual picture of what happens when somebody ultimately comes to Jesus Christ. It's perfect. You're healed. You're in the beloved. God has saved your soul. I want you to notice, uh, take a look at verse 10. Many, many were amazed and, and wondered at this, but I don't think they understood it. They were filled with wonder and amazement, but they didn't understand it. And that's the sense here. And if you go over to chapter 4, verse 14, the leaders, Caiaphas and, and the, the leaders of the Sanhedrin, they saw this guy standing there. They knew who he was. Scripture says they had nothing to say. They could not explain it. How, how do you explain how do you explain it to somebody when they find God and they turn their life around? Now, you know what happens because it happened to you, I trust. But people can't explain it. I, I accepted the Lord years ago. You know what somebody, you know what a family member said? We'll see how long this lasts. Still going. I had a guy years ago say to me, after I've seen him 36 years later, you're no different. Oh, yes, I am. I'm totally different. I'm not perfect. Only in him, I'm not perfect here, but I am different. People don't understand it. Take a look at verse 9. All the people, group after group after group after group, in the temple, knew who this guy was, and they couldn't explain it. And, it. and it leads to Peter's second sermon, which is for another time, right? What is the huge takeaway here? Remember, in the name of Jesus Christ, all rule, all power, all authority... You and I are extension of all of that, all that he is. His life and his ministry, his heart. And we forget that. Uh, very quickly, uh, verse 4. I want to go back to this very quickly before I close, in closing. Peter said, look at us. That's what he said to the man, look at us. Look at what you and I have. Peter saying to the guy, look at what I have. Look at what I have to give you. Now, you know you have Jesus Christ. And we talked about this months ago in a sermon. The spirit of glory rests upon God's church in the same way that the spirit of glory rested in the camp in the Old Testament. Same thing. Spirit of glory rests upon the church. We have Jesus Christ. We have the message. We have the gift of God. Peter says, look at us. Money's not the answer, folks. Money provides neither healing nor salvation. Help a person in need, but don't stop there. Give them Jesus. Uh, because I... I, I say that, uh, like Peter, we're able to reach out to people who are broken in mind, body, spirit, and we're able to extend the hand of Christ to them and help them see that he makes a difference. He's able to change them. We give them to God. He gives them a future and a hope. Look at us, look at what we have. It's neither silver nor, nor gold. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And I think that that's the message that we need to take here from this place this day. That's what God has laid upon my heart. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, forgive us for our unbelief. And forgive us for the times where we 
They just give silver and gold, and we do not give Jesus Christ. And forgive us, Lord, for the times where we don't invoke your name, uh, and we have an, a spirit of unbelief where we forget um, that you possess all rule and all power and all authority in heaven and in earth. And nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible for you. You change lives. You're a God who is a, a God of miracles. You're about the miraculous. You raise the dead. And may we uh, be ever mindful as we leave this place today that we would take uh, the, the, this great, great message, this great Savior, this great hope for people in the name of Jesus, that, they, that we would give them <clears throat> what we have. We thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.